thank you very much, Jason, for the kind introduction. Um, I would like to make a connection between um, this lecture and the lecture I gave yesterday um, and ask you a question. Suppose we will have a marker test for, for example, dwarfism tomorrow. <laughs> Who is interested to use it for his or her horses? Raise your hands. Suppose we will have a marker test for impulsion. <laughs> Who was interested in that? Okay. okay. That will be the topic of my second talk. Um, talking about positive genes. Um, and I must say, um, we, we, um, I have to use another brief for, to study that more in detail, the Womble course, which was made for that just as an example, um, but of course I stick close to the Frisian horse. It is, if you have remarks on, compare it with, with the Frisian horse, please interrupt. Um, but we have to go from facts, and, and there has been more published on the Wombler than on the Frisian horse yet. We're working on it, but, so please interrupt. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So the content of the presentation. First the introduction, show you a nice movie of a horse. Um, let me talk about well, how our horse selected, pedigree is important, the movement and the confirmation. I mean, these are two, the main criteria of, of how we look at horses. Um, we start with the papers next to the horse and then movement and confirmation are essential. Um, and then finally I will end with, with conclusions. <coughs>
We, we are mainly looking at sport horses, of course. Um, and, and that's an item also in the Fijian horse. You, you have to think about that. Do we stick to the classical type or do we go to the sport horse? In a couple of weeks, I will go to Blauhus. Anybody knows Blauhus? Yep. Yeah. Well, it's, it's in the center of, of uh, Friesland. Uh, and therefore, it, in fact, the, the Fijian horse was well made, I'm not saying that, but that, that's where the basic knowledge is stored. Uh, and I have to go there and I have to give a presentation about similar like this. And we're going to discuss about should we stick to the classical horse or should we go to the sport horse. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if I will survive that evening. <laughs> Maybe when I go there and then I find my car on four wounded. <laughs> <laughs> I walk home and just throw stones at me, I don't know. That can happen. No, I'm sure you have to walk. So. Okay. <laughs> you can be there. Okay. okay. The main thing is discussion. I mean, um, going into a sport or direction isn't everything. I will show you that. It also has a bad side. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we did it, we made it. We started with the agriculture horse on the left, and we, we made a fine uh, dressage and jump horse uh, from it, of it. Um, and, and we are very impressed by that. Um, but again, there are also other sides uh, connected to it. But let's have a look what, what happened, in fact. Now, what you see here is a sport horse in balance with the rider, but things can go differently. The sport was not in balance with the right, it's a whisk. Um, on the left, you see a, a walnut owner with a very expensive horse, uh, but is not able to ride a horse properly. Uh, uh, we learn our young riders to start from the left side. I know Icelandic people start from the left side and the right side. And so we have to deal with that. They buy an expensive horse, they cannot ride a horse, that's a risk. On the right side, you see a of course, a Frisian horse built for the classical way of movement with an experienced rider on it, things can go wrong. But you should realize that, that there's a chance that, that um, injury is developing. And that is the whole key issue in looking at movement, looking at confirmation, what is ideal. You would like to go for the excellent movement, but on the other hand, you will have a, 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 a bigger chance for injury. And it's about the balance, that's what we talk about. And you have to find that balance within your breed, um, I said, your, your breed uh, goal, breeding goal, let's say like that. So conserve the type, in fact, and then come with a, an optimal conformation and an optimal movement in that. That's why I, I uh, show you this, this slide. And I show that to everybody, uh, and then people realizing that. So when, we, when you want, would like to go into a sport or a direction, um, or you have to maybe modify things, let's, let's be honest about that. <clears throat> and you are already looking into that because you name sport horses uh, to specific stallions. Some breeding stallions can become a sport horse, or you talked about that in, in, in the meeting. So you're recognizing that. There's a market for it.
when you judge a sport horse, that can be a wandered horse, can be a Frisian horse, can be another breed which would like to go into the sport horse direction, what do we look for? First of all, the pedigree, of course. And there you see the jury on, on the side <coughs> here. It's Jan Bennett, probably some people know him, chairman of the jury. Um, he was one of the founding fathers of our Wonder Horse. Um, well, they look at the pedigree, instinct on paper, proven offspring, of course, look at the falls, what have the falls done, and then we decide if it's interesting horse or not. Then we will have a look at the movement and what we would like to see for a sport horse if we're eager to move horse, to go, to have go. That's what people are saying. A reliable horse and a balanced character. The character is all also important. Um, then when you look into the confirmation, the third point, and I will specify it in, in, in it. it should have a breathtaking appearance, um, head, and, head and height, carrying itself with easy selling. Um, functional requirements aimed at performance, and that's a key element. So the confirmation should make to facilitate performance um, and don't handle performance in one way or another. When that happens, then there's a clear chance for developing legs. And last but not least, uh, in general, a low risk for limbs, a durable horse for a, a, a longer time staying with us for, for uh, performing. So this is, in, in a nutshell, where it should we look at when we look at a sport horse. Um, I already pointed out, horse feeding is not a lottery, um, but, but uh, um, there's a strange phenomenon going on. Um, within the wonder breeds, for example, the best wonder breed, when you look at Totilas, the pedigree, it's from Grimaldi, which is Dressage, and on the other side, from Nimago, which is Jumping. So, apparently, uh, by combining Dressage and Jumping, you get the excellent horse. That's what's happening, that's what we see. And you should think um, within the Frisian horse breed if you might work across a similar line. So meet the classical type, meet the sport type, and then um, at some point uh, mix those two to, to get maybe the excellent performing horse. We don't know yet if it's true, but on paper that has been advised to populations. Um, so have several subpopulations within your a general population and then um, sometimes cross them or, or, or uh, combine them and then you get um, uh, a good horse but also you preserve the variation within the population so don't go with the whole breed into one direction have several directions and at one time and mix them and this is, this is what happened with Tokens uh, being a combination of a jumper and a precise horse so what we in fact want is uh, early detect the excellence in locomotive form. Here you see a foal um, and you see a, a air horse, uh, both um, have an excellent gait and that's correlated. I did some work on that and, and at early age you can detect that. Uh, in fact there is a saying that if you look at a horse at three weeks, three months and three years it's the same horse. And if you have an eye for a horse you can detect that. So that's possible. We, I prove that. We prove that. That is possible. So at your age, you can detect that. Um, and I know, for example, the one with uh, breed is they, they look at, at how the, the, the young horse, the, the foals are coordinating, if they really have a, a, a elastic movement already at young age to select for the other <coughs> side or actually young horses. Okay, we can talk to each other about that, but uh, the best thing, the best way to, to do that, in fact, is um, come to a objective analysis. And does um, anybody know this place here? It's close by. In fact, it's at Stanford University.
here the easy uh, sixteen uh, the camera is there on, in the, the cabin to get ropes across the path away. And the horse is moving and then pulling the rope and then the picture was taken and then on the right side you see the um, the combination of the pictures and then how that's how the film and the video developed. So that uh, enabled us to see um, to analyze the, the locomotion, the game of horses. Um, and still when you talk to people from an um, from uh, an academy for arts or something like that, they will remind this. So they prepared the horse, gave them the solution to look at the uh, moving object. Um, and if we look at a, at a horse, um, normally, usually when we use uh, our own eyes, it's, it's at the frequency of 20 hertz, so 20 images per second to look at a horse locomotion, and you lose track of the horse. Um, so that's why you have automatic systems which go at a higher frequency. Um, we have a motion analysis system from 100 to 230 hertz and has to video up until 1000 hertz. That's too much for looking at post locomotion. I mean, 100 or, or 240 hertz is enough. But systems are there to, to uh, uh, have a look at, at, uh, at the horses. And well, you see already the Pegasus system. We indeed tested that on, on Frisian horses um, already. We had 12 Frisian horses. Um, being judged by the jury, the regular jury, and we use the payment system to analyze the movement. In fact, um, in the um, <coughs> bandages here, uh, there is a, a, a sensor, a um, gyroscope, and an accelerometer, um, and a compass, and um, by using those four sensors, we can get a description of the locomotion up here. We did a pilot test in 12 months, and we, we're looking at that now, and it seems that the results are are similar to the results we find in Wombler. So we'll show you the Wombler horses, and when we come back one day here, or you come to Europe, mm -hmm. then we'll show you uh, the results from the test, or we write the scientific paper, and you get it. No problem. <laughs> so we only we have a system now where we can uh, come to an objective um, opinion about the locomotion of the horse. And that's for you a possibility to, to um, have a say a number next to what you see so you can realize where you were but I will show you how we did that in the world of horses. So help is on the way. First understand what the horse is doing and then you can change that and see how the horse is changing its movement and then you can see if you like that or not. If it's more functional or not more functional. This is how we did that in the early days you see that the person on the left is still with without any gray hairs. <laughs> that was a very long time ago. Um, we scored a group of one horses that we did a objective measurement and, and um, in fact we used the uh, linear scoring system from the Wombers um, to look at the trot. We, we made a combined score, the length of stride, the suppleness and the impulsion and uh, we, we, combined, we correlated that to the measurements we did. So we had an objective measurement system, uh, and that's how we found out what we look at. So this is what the judge is, is, is scoring, and when we measure the locomotion, we, we can see what he or she is looking at. And that's an object that gives an objective opinion about the horse. And that was also a request from, from the KSPS already, uh, to do that test with 12 horses, to come to an objective opinion about the horses, to see how the horses are now and when we want to change it, when we want to uh, come to a separation between classical, for example, before this, then we have a way to demonstrate that to you, what's going on. But we can learn away from the warmers. <coughs> Let's have a look, probably five with the warmer horses. This is, uh, when we talk about a good mover, this is what came out of the, the measurements. Um, a good move is you have longer strides, it's pretty logical, um, a longer swing phase, uh, and to achieve that, he or she uses, or that's what we measure, a more scapular rotation, more fetlock extension, so suppleness from the fetlock, more knee action and more tarsal action. Um, so that means flexion, a higher range of, 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 uh, of motion. Um, so we took 24 horses and we, we scored them, we, we measured them, and this is what came out. These are the key elements of what we look at when we judge a horse. When we look at the quality of the trot of a horse, 
Let's be honest about that. <coughs> the last one of these, we look at protraction and retraction. What is that? Um, first, we draw two vertical lines like that. This is protraction of the hind limb and retraction of the foreleg. Um, so again, this is retraction, this is protraction, this angle, this is protraction angle, this is retraction angle, and what we found is that a good mover needs more retraction of the foreleg and more protraction from behind it. That's very essential. It's a key element for a sport horse. It's a key element for a sport horse type horse. And that might be something for you to look at when you look at your Asian horse. Um, if, if, if it's there, uh, and in, in, in what percentage? Because the Frisian horse has to be more. Um, also has to give us a very um, more expressed movement in the front and in the hind limbs. So it's complicated, not simple. This is pretty simple. Just have a, a, a good game. But Frisian horse there are more dimensions to it. But this is basic. Questions about it? This. If you you look at it, I mean you you see a, a retraction from the fold and a protraction from behind. You see the collection coming up. You see the dorsiflexion of the back. You see a rider on top of it and getting the same expression. Horse and rider. And that's what we want when you would like to have good marks for a sport horse type. Then in fact the rider should. I uh, hamper the horse as least as possible. So make sure that you have natural movement of the horse. <coughs> so the question is can we influence that? Can we modify that? Uh, can we improve speed, endurance, loading capacity? Um, all goals of training. Another goal of training is, is safety awareness to perform. Very important in our sport horses. There are also our only are allowed to, to do dressage, <coughs> we will kill the horse. We will mentally kill the horse. Um, so that's happening to our warm blood horses. Um, and, but the most important thing, of course, is, is improve of coordination. And can we do that? Well, we need some work on that. That's how we measure the locomotion. <coughs> um, so we had a treadmill. We had markers glued to the horse. They don't have uh, they don't reject it, no problem with that. They, they move, and then you can, um, by, by sending the signal, a, a light signal, to these markers, the neck of course goes back, and then we can uh, measure the locomotion. Nowadays, I already showed you the Pegasus system, we probably only need four sensors on the limb, and then we get an estimation or an objective opinion on the, on the movement. So the systems are improving, the systems are getting mobile. You cannot do this uh, just outdoors. With the Pegasus system, we can work outdoors. So. We make it cool. So what happened to this group of horses, which we compared, in fact, seven days of, of pasture versus seven days of training. So 12 horses were sent out to pasture and 12 horses were trained, and we measured the coordination just on treadmill, on the standardized conditions, just for learning, for, for teaching uh, purposes. <coughs> you should realize that what, what I show you here is, say, from the lab, or from the lab just to install, but okay, call the lab. Uh, and what we try to do now is get it into practice, just uh, with the regular curry. So what we did we find? This was the, the training and the control groups. The training horses were, were uh, trained for dressage and jumping five days a week, and the weekend they had a horse walker training, um, and uh, um, people from the Netherlands who recognize Berlin, that's why the, the young riders are trained. And in Brunson, that's uh, in the southern part of the Netherlands, then they have a hay and pasture and very nice environment. So the horse was sent out to pastures on a holiday for 24 hours a day. So we thought that if we do this with two and a half year old young wonders, that this would be the control group and that would be the training group. So we would expect not an effect here and a training effect over there. Let's have a look what, what happened. This is what happened in the, in the training group. Um, in fact, those horses were moving on the bed, on the treadmill, um, like a sport horse type. That's what we 
Oscar was fourth horse. <coughs> we saw more scaffold rotation, and we saw uh, less feather extension in the full limb and more feather extension in the hind limb. So in fact, we proved that those fourth horse type when are trained, you get more pressure on the hind limbs. You um, move away from the bottom to the hind limbs. In fact, we saw a less causal flexion, um, but a faster protraction of the hind limb. So we think that those horses, they were, they were young, two and a half year old horses, that they have to learn to move on the bit. So they, they um, could not deal with an extreme, extreme flexion of the hind limbs. So they made it more economically. So they, they, they reduced the toss of flexion. And in that way, they could increase the uh, protraction of the hind limb. The protraction of the hind limb was faster. And if you, you look back to the the slide about the good movers, then you now understand what's happening with training. You make the hind limb faster. Again, contributing to collection, again, contributing to a, a better moving horse. Another thing is that we recently proved that uh, when you flex the neck, uh, then you will ease the flexion of the loins and also get a better protected hind limb, more or less. So there's a rationale behind uh, working horse with a flex neck. Just as an aside. So this is what's happening when you train your horses, and you, you realize that because you're familiar with the more scapular rotation. We think that if, if the horse has fine balance, then the more scapular rotation will also lead to more prone retraction on the forelimb and the hind limb. This was hap what happened in the, in the pasture group. Um, things changed. We saw lower strides in the forelimb and the hind limb. We saw more feather extension on the front limb and less in the hind limb. So they were in fact moving like that. They had me on a holiday. <laughs> they were totally in relaxed manner. So in fact, you can say that by sending horses out to pasture, it's also a, a, a form of training. Uh, but we think that it possibly has to do with the way we treat the horse beforehand. Because they were in a box stall from, from uh, full age on and only got some uh, uh, pasture movement, uh, some hours during the day. And now those horses were, were 24 hours a day at pasture, so they really uh, enjoy that and show a more or less movement. But just for you to keep in mind, you have a lot of space here. You don't have that anymore in the Netherlands, so enjoy that. <laughs> and make sure the horses can go in, into the pasture. And some people say the horse are too expensive, so they can damage, so we should put it in the pasture. Mm -hmm. Well, that's happening. I don't kind of blame them in that sense. But, okay. <coughs> so apparently, we, we showed that an exercise machine has influence on coordination. We even within 70 days, and, and well, we will see it in the afternoon too, that after 50 or 70 days of training, horses can can improve their yeah. locomotion. So that's why we had that test for people for 70 days to judge, of course, it's not <coughs> So, <laughs> <laughs> well, the guys aren't here, are they? <laughs> so we can talk among each other. <laughs> Find 
maybe the sport court and maybe the press court, <coughs> but it is a hospital. So I would like to go through the confirmation now, the general confirmation judging, and see what signs were involved for, uh, for objective information and proof. So we judge the neck, from the the back and hind limbs, that's how we judge it. And again, it's based on functionality. Do we have a, a race horse, do we have a sport horse, um, or a carriage horse? So that, that's the difference. Still, some general principles are similar. First, let's have a look at the neck, the neck functionality. And I must say, within the freaking horse, we do an excellent job. I was in clinics, I was on call the other day, and, um, and I saw a lot of wonder horses with, with and problems coming from the neck. Um, so things are happening out there, let's be honest about that. Um, what is important when you look at ideal confirmation, and you see here the difference between a sport horse type horse and a, a thoroughback horse. Here we need the flexion, so it would be easy when the horse already bored with a flex neck. And here we would like to have a long neck because we need the oxygen, the air coming in, and the CO2 coming out. Um, so it's a different way of, of looking at, at uh, the confirmation of the neck. And then another item uh, with that is the white and the mineral, of course. Um, so we, we judge that uh, looking at the length, the musculature, and the position of the neck. And that's a key element, I think, within the Fijian horse that that's a lot of, of necks are really uh, in, in a, square, a square position or really like that, very, very straight, even much more than, than the one with horse. Um, so you, you did a very good job on developing the neck. Um, well, I see some wonderful horses having problems with that. But this is basic. Um, what is behind the neck conformation and, and how is it connected to functionality? It's what you want from the horse. That's what's happening now. Hey, the people have bought a, a, a an ordinary horse. That you asked about that, just with a straight neck, and then they try to do this, and things can go wrong. Uh, we also prove that, so we have to be aware of that and protect the owners from from doing that. And you see, uh, next week our process is in, so that can give problems. So just for the vets among us to pay attention to things. This is the research we did. We made some publications about that, looking at the different uh, neck postures. Um, in fact, here you see the, just the unloaded position. And there you see uh, the FEI position. And these are the two high reflection positions. And this is the extreme opposite position. And in fact, with all those four positions, we proved that you get a reducing of the nerve speed, you have the cervical vertebrae, the nerves are coming out, and when you have them for 30 minutes like that, then the, the conduction speed of the nerves will, will reduce. So, there's a message behind that, and it will happen, um, especially in this posture. Um, that's, not a, that's not a big, that's not a big deal, because if we, I mean, if we prevent that, we should have white horses. There is scientific proof for the fact that if you <coughs> ride a horse, that the horse has a bigger chance of developing labels. <laughs> <laughs> there is scientific proof when you are working with a horse at a higher level, there's a higher chance. Okay, so when I talk to animal welfare people, say, so what do you want? Should we do not, not ride a horse? Then, well, then the, the horse will be totally instinctive. Mm -hmm. There's no use for the horse then. So we have to ride it, but if we ride it, we have to be careful with that. We have to stay <coughs> And for example, not do this for 30 minutes, but for a couple of minutes in form of training, and then release it. Make sure there's a variation. And you should train your young riders in, 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 this, in this way. Um, so that's the, the, the key element. And I think within the region horse, we do an excellent job because your neck is, is good, very well uh, developed. But in the one that we have some problems with that, especially when people start uh, riding you know, by looking at a photograph. That's how it look. And how you have the clothes of Anki and you have the jacket of Anki and so <laughs> then we drive like Anki without a 3,000 dollar horse. It doesn't work. <laughs> so we should educate people. 
don't blame them, but okay. <laughs> Um, you know that there was some um, discussion between the Netherlands and Germany about riding horses and dressage horses, um, and that's how it all started with high reflection. Kate um, Horschman, he wrote a book about that, but he improved his life, and now he wrote a book, how a positive book uh, about the neck reflection. We need that for, to train our horses, uh, but we shouldn't uh, exaggerate it. And that's the key message. So then, when you look at the world of motion um, of the limb, it's important to understand that because then we have to define what you look for. Um, and what you see here is just an ordinary wobbler. Um, in the freezing horse, it's more complex because you, you have the elevated movement, the, uh, and, and that makes it a, a bit more difficult. But the basic function is the similar, of course. Um, we have here just the, uh, the, the fore limb, the scapula, upper limb, the lower limb. And here the, uh, the hoof. So here's the locomotive starting and the spring phase. Sorry, uh, the starting. So here, beginning of the stance phase, like that. The lift up and beginning of the swing phase and the swing phase. That's how the uh, limb is moving like that. And when we look at the different uh, functions within the limb, the different actions happening in the limb. First of all, <coughs> we get the uh, uh, here the um, extension of the, sorry, the extension of the carpal joint, then you get extension of the coffin joint and the fat joint, the limb is flexed, flexion of the carpal joint, the elbow joint, and then the locomotion starts to get. So important in that is the pendulum function, function of the scapula, like that, going like that, and the distal limb is moving in accordance with it. So if you train the scapula movement, finally, when the horse is finally balanced, you will also get the nice prone retraction of the horse. The carpal joint is important, of course, for, for supportive function, and then the fetlock for supplements. That's correlated with supplements. So if you judge a horse, look at the fetlock joint here, how the horse is, is um, uh, extending the fetlock. That's not easy uh, in the free horse, of course, but you should have a look at it and you can see it. So when we look at the functionality of the, of the problem, we talk about a riding horse. Um, you, you look at the height of the length of the wheels and the length and position of the scapula. And in fact, uh, how do we judge that? Why do we judge it? Because we would like to have a saddle and a rider on it, but it there should be enough space here. And it should be an easy and subtly, subtle protecting forelimb. If there's a saddle on the forelimb, on the shoulder blade, on the scapula, then the forelimb cannot move. That's pretty logical, but it's important to have a look at it. So that's how we, we judge it like that. It should be a long scapula, a long scapula like that, and it should be a more horizontal scapula, just to give uh, space for the, the rider and the saddle to uh, be put on the horse. Um, and in fact, we proved that if you have a more horizontal scapula, shoulder blade, then you get a more protracted forelimb, and you get rising at the front, so you get a elevated front limb. So this is what you see here. If you have a more horizontal position in your horse, the limb is more protected, more protected position. Um, but it doesn't say that um, you only can get a better protection if you have this. For example, when you look at Totilas, uh, Totilas is not very well built. I mean, he is not built uh, upwards like that, he's built downwards. Nevertheless, he's able to give an excellent performance in protection. So apparently he's not happy with that, but he doesn't have a confirmation which facilitates that. It's always a balance between optimal confirmation, optimal gait, reducing lameness, and okay, the ideal word doesn't exist, but you have to find your way. And some things are compensated by other things. When we look at the carpal joint, this, this joint here, um, uh, what we see uh, when we look, when the limb is lower, you see more carpal extension, for example here, in the racehorse, you see that it's going like that. So you get more pressure here on the front side. And we know in, in uh, um, our uh, thoroughbreds that they don't like a horse which stands like that, with the, with the back and the knees. Because you get more pressure here on the front side, and you get a bigger chance for developing chips 
or you're probably familiar with that. Uh, but in, in the freezing north in the longer heat, you don't mind that. But nevertheless, you would like to have a rather straight copper joint. That's the reason why. This is for the hind limb, similar in fact. Um, so we go <coughs> to the stand space there. Um, you get first a, 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 a in the stand space a stand selection of the calcium joint, then coffin and, and phantom joint, end of the stand space and beginning of the swing phase, the, the flexion of the knee, calcium and phantom joint, and then it starts all over again. So you have a very function, function of the hip. Here you see that all the movement is coming from the hip. And again, spring not only spring function, not only in the fat, but also in the heart joint. So that's why we would do a lot of like a very straight hops because we want to have some supplements from the heart. Uh, but first go uh, go to the upper uh, part of the We would like to have length and shape of the loins, the lower loins and a good shape and a good muscular development. Um, especially we would like to have muscles behind the knee, back in the knee here. More muscles here in this area. Because we would like to have an active powerful sub-off motor engine in the hand is the engine of course, uh, to carry a collective body and um, using the side forward and jumping up. And you need to prove that you have a more flex hip, so more horizontal position of the femur, like that. Um, you get a more rotated pelvis, and that brings, uh, gives a, um, uh, uh, a less retraction at the prop and a more collective appearance. So the, the hand is already under the body. Um, and another way to look at it is that you make sure that at judging, uh, the knee is at, at the tubercoxate there. Um, just to make sure, when the, the hand is already under the body, it's easier for the horse to protract. It's easier for the horse to give you a collective appearance. Easy for the horse to uh, be in a better sport horse. Yes? If it's too far under, though, does it uh, lose its power? Yeah. Um, when it's too far under, you can have uh, this uh, phenomenon um, that you get a laceration of the tendons here. Uh, like, when it's like that. Sure. Yeah. So again, it's a balance. Um, well, because then you talk about a weak hawk, in fact. So too weak hawk is no good. The laceration of the tendons. To straight hop isn't good either because you don't have any supplements. Should be a balance. I think. <coughs> in fact, we measured that. It was uh, proved that the, the correlation between the hop angle and the way the horse moves. But this is not important to you at this point. Just I, I tell you that it's proved and then say <laughs> Um, so another thing, and, and that's, I think, not easy for me to, to translate to the north, you know, but the rectangle and square appearance, we would like to have a, a more uh, rectangle appearance, um, because, well, we need some length uh, uh, in, in the body, of course, to uh, make sure there's a ride on it. Um, so, it should be well developed, the length position and the shape of the, of the, the, the back area, to carry the rider in any collection. Um, and another key element in a good sport horse ride right, is that um, it should be built upwards like that. So it should already have uh, the rising from the front. But again, look at Tokyo's, he doesn't have it. Still, he's able to perform like that. So it just, this is a, it could be an advantage of a horse, but if it doesn't have it, it doesn't mean that he's not able to do it. He has to perform. So we look at the back, and in group assessment we did a study on looking at, uh, when you look at the back conformation, um, what will happen when you put on a girl strap or a saddle or, or a saddle with a weight, and well, it's pretty logical that if you put on saddle and weight, you get a more uh, hyperextended back like that. So you get a bigger chance for developing, for example, kissing spines, and that's a pretty hot item in, in the, in the warm-up course uh, nowadays, not only in pre-purchase exams, but also you know, riding horses. Um, but you can imagine if you have those extreme positions of the horse that uh, when uh, the, the, the spines are more close to each other, then you get a bigger risk for developing problems over there. 
I must say I, I don't see that happening in Frisian horses, but mainly in our own horses. So the excellent movement is paying its price in that respect. And we don't know where it comes from, the kissing spine. Well, this is a pretty obvious correlation when you put more weight on, on, on the back, when you um, perform for horse for a longer time, especially the size, then there's a bigger chance for developing this entity. But how it develops, we don't know yet. But it's increasing, this, this um, entity too. Again, not only in buying and selling, but also <coughs> in the performance. They break down on their back. And usually there's a primary uh, limb problem connected to it. There's a limb somewhere in the limbs. And that's why they do that, and when they, they, they uh, make their necks very straight, and then you get sore necks, sore backs. Maybe, often it's related to the limbs. But nevertheless, when you have a less ideal conformation, there's a bigger chance for developing this disease. But I must say, I, I, I hardly see that in the motion. So maybe you are, uh, in the field you have a protection for it. You can also prevent that from, from getting this disease. So when you look at the distal limb, what is important, of course, is supporting the angle of the fetlocks, the shape of the feet, of course. So not a too straight fetlock, not a too weak fetlock. When you have a too straight fetlock, um, then you don't get mother suppleness. When it's too weak, you get a, a bigger chance for developing uh, tendon problems. So the requirements are you should carry the body, the, the body um, especially in the forelimbs as a strop, and in the hindlimbs with, with an active movement. Um, and again, there's always a balance between suppleness and, and lameness. And let's have a look at the, the next slide. About that. Um, we need uh, a proof that uh, if you have a, um, uh, a more extension of the feather, you have a higher risk for developing tendon lesions. So you, when there's a, a, a weaker position of the feather, you get more extension of the feather. We proved that. So you get a bigger risk for, for tendon lesions. Um, and in fact, what we saw on the high limbs, when there's uh, a, a more extended, a more straight walk, a more straight fat walk, then you have an increased um, uh, activation of the hind limb. So a better push of the hind limb. So there's a difference between the forelimb and the hind limb. The forelimb we need damping, in the hind limb we need a more straight fat walk um, to, give a, the, to enable the active proposing of the limb. Um, because the forelimb function as a positive squat, and the hind limb function is <coughs> activating, uh, activating the movement as a motor of the movement, the engine of the movement. So last but not least, the shape of the feet. Um, even or uneven feet. Um, another thing which we see in the world is developing now, uh, a more broad, a more wide foot with a lower heel and a more narrow foot with a higher heel. Um, we see that, in fact, well, the optimal conformation should be symmetry, of course, but we see now when in 20 to 76 percent of the population that horses have uneven feet. Um, so that's gradually getting into the, the one word, of course. Um, we have we, we looked into that, and uh, first of all, we looked at foals, and we saw that um, they have a specific posture. Our one word foals, when they when they are eating, grazing, um, they use all sorts of of uh, standing like that to graze. Are you familiar with this? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, what we proved is that, um, uh, have a look at this, this video. Do it again. What do you notice? He puts that one foot forward. He's only putting the same uh, leg up front. Mm -hmm. So you should do that like this. Do it by yourself like that and change it like that. You feel that you have a preference. Yeah. The same you see in, in our folds. They all have a preference. Um, and um, we think, in fact, we prove that, is that um, if they stand in the same position the whole way long like that, then this foot will be the lower heel foot and that will be the high heel foot. So you get, in fact, uh, an unevenness of feet because of their um, handedness and because of their grazing position. You can reduce that by trimming. 
<coughs> definitely, but it, it's, it's inborn, in fact, in that respect. So they, you think they are born, in fact, it the models. They are born with just symmetrical feet, mm -hmm. and because of, of uh, more loading on the retracted foot, or less loading on the retracted foot, it's getting steeper, and uh, more loading on the protracted foot is getting uh, a low heel like that. So you get unevenness in the feet. Um, that's on an individual level. Um, and we also look at that at the population level. So in fact what we see, um, we see that the hoof angles are different, but the fetlock angles are um, different too, but nevertheless the foot axis is straight. So apparently not only the hoof are developing asymmetrically, but also the fetlock joint. So you have two different limbs in fact, especially in the forelimbs, I already pointed out that suppleness is important, fetlock extension is important. So then you have one limb who is, is, have a good suppleness, and the other one has a less suppleness. So there's some form of asymmetry in it. And you should be aware of that and, and do something about it, prevent it. Because uh, when we would like to go for high performance, there, there is a, a problem with that. This is what is happening at the population level. I already told you that bone only for performance is not ideal either. So this is what, what happened with our wonder horse. You see here on the horse I took bar the years from 1990 to 2002. And here on the vertical axis you see the height of the widths. And you see by time, this is the height of the width that's increasing. So we are breeding horses with a higher, higher with a larger higher widths, the higher horses. You like it, you'd like to have a very impressive front. So the height of the ribs is increasing like, with time, like that. What we also see, the bars here, is the, the percentage of uh, the population having uneven feet. And you see that it starts there with around 3 to 4 percent, it's increasing to around 10 percent. Um, so we think that normally 5 percent of the population has this, but it's an increasing phenomenon now. And even our, some stallions have it in a, in a rather, um, well, you, you can see very clearly. Um, so in connection to that, when we look at the scores of the neck length, we see that that is introducing. So what will happen when you probably select for higher quitters, who are growing, fast growing horses, is you get shorter necks. And those horses have less opportunity to graze with the, the limbs standing next to each other. So it, it probably will enhance this phenomenon. It's not a big deal in that respect. We need to, to uh, work on that, prevent that as much as possible. But because we select for optimal locomotive performance, I meaning the Wombat horses, the Dutch Wombats are the best in the world for jumping the size, there's also a downside to it. It's not a problem. You have to, to go to it. But, well, that's, that's I mean, that's the, the, the when you start reading, selecting into a specific direction, and well, you, you um, neglect a little bit the other direction. So that's, that's illustrated here in the one with the horse. So every advantage also has a bit advantage in that respect. So when you look at the desires, you see here the percentage of offspring with uneven feet. And these are the number of sires here. And you see that normally the, mo the majority of the sires have around 5% of the offspring has uneven feet. But you see that there are sires here who have uh, a very big percentage, 20 to 25 of their offspring has uneven feet. So there is a genetic component next to it. There's no gene for uneven feet, but probably because of we select for high conditions, then this development will, will uh, is, is, is uh, stimulated, and then you see this happening with those, with those studies. And there's another phenomenon connected to it. It's when we look at longevity, when we look at how long do those horses will perform. And we looked at quite a number of horses, um, as you can see here. And here on the axis, for example, I can see the, the years in sports. Uh, and on the vertical axis here, you see the survival. So when it starts at one, that means that every horse is still in the population. Now when um, you see here that all the four curves they're decreasing like that, so when a horse is longer in sports, it will, there's a bigger chance for um, uh, uh, leaving the population. This logically I mean, can happen. Um, 
but there's a difference now between basic level and international level. <coughs> Here you see the horses with uneven feet uh, working at a basic level. And there you see the horses with even feet working at a basic level. So you see that that population, basic level, they start with one and then gradually it's reduced. Similar phenomenon here, but those two curves, these are horses performed at international level. These, the, the interrupted line is um, the horses are the horses with uh, even feet, and this line, the straight line, is the horses with uneven feet. You see that within three years, you see a very uh, big reduction, um, a particular reduction of number of horses in their population. Comparing the horses with uneven feet, they leave the population earlier than you would expect or then, in fact, horses with even feet are doing. This is for dressage. Are you, do you understand this? Okay. When you look at the jump it's a little bit worse. Um, you see that within three years, the, the, the guys with uneven feet at international level are all leaving the population. Um, well, this is what we think is happening. Um, you can also say, okay, apparently, um, the, horse, the, the jumpers with the uneven feet are so good, they're all sold to the US. <laughs> that's, why, that's why they leave our population. Um, but never, it's a sign. You should be aware of that. Think of it. I mean, jumping has more risk of jumping later than, than, than the size. When we look at the front end, maybe. Um, so that's just an illustration of that. Again, selecting in one way also has a downside in the other way. No problem, but we have to be aware of that and have to work on that. And, and prevent that as much as possible. <coughs> so, coming back to uh, the, the conclusion or the, the last slide, um, again, change in confirmation um, also uh, gives a, a, a change in risk for developing memories. <coughs> and when we look at those two horses again, the classical horse, we, we have there the big cyst in the navicular bone. You're probably familiar with that, or well, you don't have it in this country, of course, but we had that. We have, I'm admitting it. Um, and because of selection, we, we now, at least in my clinic, in our country, we have a reduced number of those horses with the big cyst in the navicular bone. Uh, nevertheless, because we, we, we now made the sport horse, we still have problems in that area, but they are more in the self tissue now. So again, you improve one thing, you have better bone quality of the navicular bone, nevertheless, the stress is still there. But, but in the soft So, just reminds you on, on how you look at confirmation and how you look at, at uh, developing the risk for life. Okay, so what we find in fact is that the confirmation square stance correlates with the limb angles and trot. So it means that if you judge a horse when it stands standing square, then there's a correlation with, with how it's moving. That's why we do that, at square stance. When the horse is moving, you cannot judge it. You only can judge uh, subjective scores on that. So if they have activity, they are supplements, the length of stride, but we don't know exactly what the limbs are doing. That's why we have the opportunity to measure that in the future. Again, yeah, extreme joint angle that squares out and so the similar joint angle that trucks. So when you have a very straight hop, it will also be a straight hop in the locomotion. And you will have the disadvantage of that, less supplements, for example. Last but not least, experience has a practical basis. So the, the, the guys in the bowl have they have practical experience. They know what they talk about. You think? Um, I know for sure. But it also has a biochemical explanation. So you can do it also. But you should train your eyes. And in fact, when I talk, when I talk about experience, is 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 science just numbers uh, in combination with English speaking food. <laughs> Um, feeling for looking at horses, and that's what you can develop. And some people have more than others, nevertheless, it's there. And science can give you numbers and the evidence, and that when you increase science, then you will increase your experience. Because I can tell you, I have it now, what is happening with numbers, and you can train your own eye now with the knowledge I gave, I gave to you. So, what makes the riding horse ideal? Um, a more horizontal scapula, a weaker fabric in the front for more suppleness, a more vertical pelvis, make sure that the hind limb is under the body, 
and a more upright fabric in the hind, just to give more support in, to the active hind bend, in fact. This is what was, is proven in numbers. And you should let it now to the practical situation when you judge a horse. So, to conclude, in fact, feeling <laughs> coming. The ideal riding horse, is made of sweet steel, has a South African wheelbase, prairie there, a frame strong suspension, easy going, but a very tight German hand suspension, <laughs> tennis made from British Kevlar, assembled with a split, uh, Swiss precision, and boy, you know where this horse was bred. <laughs> Could be either in the Netherlands or in the US. <laughs> And this is, I think, what, what will stimulate your discussion, and now the word is for you. Um, talking about the Frisian horse, um, I mean, it's, it's, I was amazed by the number of horses here in the US now, 15,000. I thought the total number of Frisian horses was 30, but I checked it out on the website, the total number is 40,000. And you've already 50,000, and it's amazing. So you're doing a good job here. And you have to decide, but again, I will go to Blauhus and can I survive that? You <laughs> <laughs> have the next discussion, but you should think about this. Look at, at, at a very good functionally performing horse, the one Just have a look at that and see what you would like to use in the Frisian horse uh, for the next generation Frisian horse in fact. Um, and uh, just have a look at this to conclude. Learn from it. This is extreme, it's really extreme.